That's hot. Do you need sugar? I think so. Okay. Is it too hot? No, no. We've been having a good chat in your absence. Oh, good. Maybe I've got a soporific effect on Dad. <laughs> the comfort of having you there. <laughs> or the boredom of me oh. saying the same thing over and over. What is it, Dad? What kind of family were you born into? Where were you born? I was born in uh, Paddington Women's Hospital, who I went home to uh, to school and told everybody I was born in Paddington Men's Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I lived in Bondi all my life, all my young life, Bondi and Bellevue Hill. What kind of a place was it back then? I was, Bondi was just, um, as it is now, only everything's treble the price, at least. Yeah. But uh, all small, semi-detached houses in Bondi itself. Was the Bondi Pavilion there when you were little? Uh, oh yeah. It was the, it's that old. Still there. Yeah. Okay. Bondi Pavilion's been there. Well, uh, originally Bondi Beach had two two big piers, concrete piers out into the water. They're not there anymore. And they blew them up during the war oh. because they thought the Japanese had land and and go, take cover under the. So they blew them up and and uh, covered the beach with uh, barbed wire. And uh, they had two guns, one at the end that fired actually. The other one was made of tin foil, <laughs> making out we had two guns. <laughs> but the kids used to play, and then Rose Bay Golf Links was covered with uh, anti aircraft guns. Uh, every now and then they'd have a few shots in the air to proves that they actually worked. Oh. But, uh, well, the Japanese were expected in, in 19, what, 1941, 42. Yeah, I think. I'm not sure, Dad. Like Sometime around the then. Ages. Well, the war started in 1939 in Europe. But uh, 41, for, I think 41 was uh, uh, on the letter, what do you call it? Hawaii, wasn't it? Oh, what, that Pearl Harbor business? Pearl Harbor. Mm. But I think that was 41. Mm. But, um, and then I remember going out in the, in the morning one time, 
I'm going into mum and say, oh, we've been attacked last night. I'd gone out on the veranda and I'd seen the searchlights in the air. And she said, oh, silly. Go down and get the paper. <laughs> Came and put the paper and it said, Bondi shelled. Oh. And they'd um, fired shells over Bondi. Yeah. They landed in Bondi, Wallara, Bilby Hill, Rose Bay, and um, fired from the mother submarine. Yeah. which towed three of the, what they call midget submarines, which were quite big actually. Right. And they just had two two um, people on board and uh, one was sunk in the harbour. Only one, uh, one found one recently in outside the heads. Did they? Hmm, on the, near, near Manly somewhere. Right. And the last two years I think it was. And then one got back, I think one got back to the mother submarine, but the mother submarine was just firing shots at bomb line. Yeah. And one landed in our back street, in uh, Simpson Street. And... Uh, so 11, year, 11 or 12 years old you were at the time. Mm. That must have been huge for you. Oh, so that we thought it was wonderful. <laughs> to have shells flying around <laughs> and uh, across the road from our place in the back street was a big block of flats which one uh, some of their garages were being put together and made into uh, air raid shelter right. and I was in charge of that. I had all the kids dressed in uniforms and everything. <laughs> silly, silly. Well, as little kids, you probably didn't realise how kind of mm. you probably didn't realise how scary it really was. Oh, no, it you was thought it was a game. Or no. Were you frightened? I wasn't frightened. But we put on uh, shows of the night and charged everybody a shilling or two shillings, <laughs> which I think I pocketed. <laughs> I don't remember what I did with the money, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> All the kids were under, under my orders. <laughs> it was quite, quite dramatic. You were a manager even back then, Dad. Mm. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. My, I was born in 19, 1930. Yeah. My mum was born in 1908. Yeah. Um, yeah, can we give that to the other? Both parents born here. Mm -hmm. Both parents were born in Australia. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes, I could still become a Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they like it or not. Still watching the news, I see. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I wouldn't have any arguments. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you must find it hilarious, all the stuff that's been going on. Oh, it's a joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, things are a joke and they know it too. Yeah. And they, they just keep doing it because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> they don't realise they've got to be leading a country. Yeah. That's their problems. You've seen a lot of changing of the guard over the years too, haven't you? Governments swapping from one side to another. Oh yeah. Well, when you think of it, what we've had in the last few years, we've had one, two, three, four, four prime ministers, five prime ministers in a couple of, couple of years, haven't we? Yeah. Should never happen. Yeah. What they get to do is settle down to be Prime Minister. Yeah. Settle down and do the things that are good for Australia and not worry about whether you're a Catholic or a bloody Muslim or what. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it, just go ahead until they start doing that. 
and things have worked there together. But um, they're a bit, a bit over the wall at the moment. Mm. Yeah. So tell me about the Opportunity School. That was at Manara in the education department. We were picking kids along the road that were showing um, to their advantage of uh, showing uh, that they had a know-all. Know-all? Probably know-alls. <laughs> no, I was one of them. <laughs> but um, the idea was to select children to go to Sydney High School which was the pick of all the schools at the time. Right. They, I opened up this opportunity class at Wallara. It was the first one when I was a member of that. And the idea is to nurture you on to uh, bigger things. Then by the time you all went to Sydney High, supposedly uh, educated enough to uh, be the top of the range, you know. Yeah. You know, whether that was true or not, I don't know. But um, most of the ones that went there did really well. But my mother, like her sister, they were a bit jealous of each other, I think. Because um, her, sis her sister and my auntie had sent John, my cousin, to uh, high school at Catholic school at uh, well, uh, at Waverley, and um, my mother thought she'd do the same. Same she sent me to one just around the corner um, in Randwick, which gave good education, but uh, not as good as the opportunity class. I uh, only spent one year in the opportunity one. Yeah. And um, it's a pity. Did uh, you enjoy school? I didn't mind school. Mm. Didn't mind at all actually. What did you like about it? Oh, I knew I was learning all the time. I know I was a good, uh, good listener, and I knew from one day to another that I'd learned something mm. all the time. What did they do well back then? Oh, they they made you join into everything, they made everybody interested. Mm. I think that's a very important thing that the that the class, whatever you're doing, it should be interesting rather than just uh, saying, you've got to learn this. And I think, uh, from what I remember, is the teachers didn't float over a subject. They went right, they delve into it all the time. Yeah. So that uh, they knew they were teaching something. And I think that's very important. And I believe that uh, somewhere along the line, rubbed off on my three children. Yeah. Not that they had uh, any much to do with me, but still. Even from, even from my mother. My mother's a good uh, student. Well, she had good education too, didn't she? Mm -hmm. But mainly in England. Right. She was. Australian, but she went there as a young girl. She went to a very kind of modern school. She went to a co-educational boarding school called yeah. Moncton Wild. There was co-education mm. in England there. At, uh, that's down near Dorset. Mm. You know, Dorset's the most expensive place to live in in England after London. Is it? Mm. Mm. Boris and I used to go on uh, higher boats 
rowboats Ross Cutters by and row out to the American warships. Yeah. And then go alongside and they take us inside and give us chocolates and <laughs> and chips and things and we'd sit there with them and uh, tell them how to run the war. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. But, and you were uh, just quite little at this stage? Oh, we were you? only youngsters who were at school, that would have been first year. First year. What does first year uh, mean in today's terms? First year, which is um, like uh, sixth class yeah. in the primary, then you go into first year. Okay. Now you've been seen as a threat. Who have you wrote out? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, Dad, Dad and Boris, what about when you climbed, went into the air base? No. Oh, yeah, we went out to the, we got under the fence at the, at Bankstown. No, Bankstown. Bankstown Aerodrome. The two of us were sitting up in the American warplane, having a game of it. And trying to drive it, weren't you? Yeah, and the big American bloke with a big gun came in. <laughs> what are you doing in there? <laughs> and let us out. How long, how long did you get away with it? I was in there for about oh, a quarter of an hour, half an hour. <laughs> and the Yanks got us out and pushed us under the gate out of the, of the fence with the gun behind us. What about secondary school? Uh, what are your memories of that? Well, I wanted to do that, but uh, it was all under pressure. Because, uh, first of all, my mother had no money. It's a wartime business after that, and uh, all kids thought about it was soldiering you know, of some sort. You're educated to, to against the war, and uh, basically that's all that was all talked about. Mm. I remember every morning or every afternoon, I'd be standing on a front for an and we were there was a corner of it I could see the harbour. You see the ships going out, yeah. and you know they were carrying troops. At one time we had the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, the biggest ships in the world, here to transport Australian troops to to Egypt and that. And uh, people don't realise Australia had the biggest con contribution of troops of any country for its population. Mm. Unbelievable. Yeah. But included amongst these um, troops was your own dad. Yes. Mm. Your own dad was sent off to war eventually too. My father. Yeah. You yeah, really had to come round and get my mother to sign. They were separated. Get my mother to sign that she would let him go to the war on seven dollars a day, seven shillings a day, to um, to cover. She had to sign it. And let him go to war, otherwise he wasn't allowed to go. And he became a Tobruk rat. Mm. Tobruk was a famous thing for Australia. My mother called him the greatest rat in Tobruk. <laughs> Just for anyone who's wondering how much seven shillings would be now, God. what do you reckon it would be? Oh, seven shillings. What could you buy with it? Probably a, a loaf of bread and um, 
where we loaf bread and a little bit of corned beef or something. Yeah. On the side. You wouldn't get much, I tell you there. And at home you had yeah. mum, sister, grandmother and aunt and yourself to feed? Well, I lived with my grandmother most of the time. Okay. A lot of um, sharing. Like her other daughter lived around the corner yeah. and her son lived across the road. It's a lot of sharing the food of, um, you know, for something special or something. Yeah. It would go between the three, three mothers, the, the mother, the two daughters, yeah. and uh, a lot of sharing went on. But the kids never worried about it. Yeah. All we kept doing is digging holes in the backyard <laughs> as air raid shelters. Yeah. Wouldn't shelter you from a, from a raindrop. <laughs> and Dad said he used to um, sit on a butter box and eat dripping sandwiches. Didn't you, Dad? Oh, yeah. Teach the kids what dripping is. What is dripping? Oh, dripping was just the all out of the meat, you know, and uh, you let, let it go uh, in the ice chest. Nobody had refrigerators, and uh, till it got firm, and then you spread it on. Nobody had any money for butter. You spread it on sandwiches. So, so it was just the fat out of it. It was a necessity food. Well, it was. was a, Bread and dripping. Yeah. It, uh, oh, dreadful. <laughs> <laughs>
and then the sea, the sea rolled back into the, into the ocean. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that seemed to be very calm. And then a, a big wave built up, and it flushed up the beach and came back in, back down. And what it did, it, the people who were sheltering underneath the piers were washed out and they had to be rescued and a lot of them shouldn't have been there anyway and a lot of the people in the water shouldn't have been there because it wasn't between the flags. There could have been a lot less rescues yeah. and from there on they blew up the piers and got rid of them because it was too dangerous to swim there, you know. Yeah. And that's when they covered the beach with barbed wire and you had to, to go down to the beach, you had to go through a pathway of barbed wire all the way down to the water and follow instructions. So you loved your grandfather. Yeah. You were close to your grandfather. Well, he used to, um, every morning he'd go up, oh, he had a truck coming up the road. He used to park around the back of my grandmother's and go down the hill and turn around and come up the front hill. He used to wave to me every morning. But um, this particular one, he went to work and these young fellows who were supposed to, they had a, uh, out on Botany Road, on the way to Mascot, they had a, um, like where they sold steel rods and things like that. And they were supposed to climb on these things and um, stack the rods. And uh, he wasn't satisfied with what they were doing, so he climbed on them and the whole thing collapsed on him and killed him. And of course I was waiting every morning for him, but he, he wasn't there, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, he wasn't my legal grandfather. He was a, a substitute. A step-grandfather? Step-grandfather, yeah. yeah. But a pop. Yeah. He was the one that came, came over. They, they gave him, um, I don't know if it was new teeth or new... Uh, Glasses. No, it was teeth. That's right, because I laughed at him. And he threw them on the ground and stood on them. Oh. <laughs> and said, they're no good to me. <laughs> Who was the one that had the glass eye? Oh, I think that was on my father's side. Okay. My father lived in, as a boy in his upbringing was at Chatswood in Sydney. He lived in a, a yonder house he lived in before he died. And um, was sold for a lot of money. But nobody got anything out of it. The kids, they rang me and said that he was dying. I said, well, let him go. Oh. Or something like that. No. I wasn't very, very comfortable with it. Yeah. But he never did anything for us or the care or the family. You mentioned to me last time I saw you that back then there was no such thing as a child support agency. So your mother had to take it into her own hands. Oh yes, yeah, she used to wait outside his factory. Yeah. And she used to have to go and wait outside the, I think the one at North Sydney, or Chatswood, I think, Chatswood. Yeah. She used to wait outside to try and get some money off him, to pay the rent. On payday? On payday, and he'd back out in his big car and hand us so much money, uh, little money as he 
He'd be busy, he was going out that night, I probably. You were offered a chance to go to law school. Oh, I'd, I'd go to a lawyer. Yeah. I was at Goodyear at the time. One of the bosses there, some day, I think it was. He said, how would you like to be a solicitor? I said, there's too much study in it. He said, oh yeah, but you, you could do it. And he took me for an interview down to Pitt Street to a firm of solicitors. And they would have employed me straight away on a, on a learning business, you know. I'd have to go to uni and all that. And you didn't go ahead I with never, that? I never jumped it. I should have done it. But I was too interested in becoming the Prime Minister. Which <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never did. Hmm. And what about your stepfather being a policeman? Yeah, that's him in one of the pictures there with the football team. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, he was, um, he was also a uh, boxer in the police force and fought against very well known by black strong hand in forming the uh, Newtown Rugby League team, which was the leading team in of its day. Yeah. His name was uh, Brickell. Garnet Arthur Brickell. He ended up marrying my mother after a divorce of divorce of the first one. Yeah. And he he got you out of some scrapes, didn't he, Dad? He what? He got you out of some kind of tricky situations. Oh, well, he got me out of uh, that terrible Roger Rogerston. He's in jail at the moment. Yeah. For murder. Um, he uh, there was a law that allowed you if you wanted to go to the toilet. You'd pee on the side of your left hand wheel of your own car if you couldn't find a toilet. And it was a, it was legal to do it, and I did it. Next thing, a hand grabbed me by the uh, and the shoulder with Roger Rogers. Next thing I know, I was in there wagon going up to Darlington's police station oh, under arrest and um, my stepfather was said what is he doing here? They said they told the story. He said let him go immediately. He'd be doing it on his own car. And he said, yeah but we're not to know that are we? Well you are now and let me go. I had to walk all the way back to the bloody cross. That was lucky, I think, to get away from yeah, somebody gosh. like that. Yeah, Wasn't well, he's, it, a, yeah. he's a terrible man. That yes. Shot a bloke, just came up behind him at um, North Ride and just pulled a gun out and shot a bloke dead. He's a policeman, he's just mad. Roger Rogerson. Oh, and Dad, you used to tell us about um, the kind of gambling joints in the city. Um, oh, yeah. Tomo's or something like that, was it? Or yeah, Tomo's. Well, they were... Um, Where were they? And well, there's one Pitt Street between Park and Market Street. Where really, that bloke just came in and um, over a debt, just shot a bloke dead on the table. And Tomos were in, I think, in, in, in King Street. They were notoriously illegal gambling joints. 
we'd see it flourish and the coppers knew all about them. They never did anything to them to get rid of them. Why is that? Oh, well, there's too much money floating around for the coppers. Yeah. And, um, Mainly, uh, mainly this was caused by underpayment of the coppers by the state government. Underpayment, and you cause you cause criminality, criminality you know, by having um, underpaid police. Naturally, they're going to get in when there's big money floating around. Didn't you see some some? politicians and kind of famous oh, yeah. people at the gambling joints? Yeah, you go to a gambling joint and guarantee, well, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, he was the Premier at the time. Um, was it Askin? Askin. He used to hang around the gambling joints. I think he owned them. <laughs> few of them, but I can't remember the names of them. But there were a few at the cross, or some of the cross, some of the city, plenty of them. But um, I couldn't pick them out by name now. The war ended. And the bloke um, skipped down George Street. There's the a, famous photo, a famous photo. I remember that uh, happening there. Yeah. yeah. We were up at uh, Castle Rose Street. We went down, and that was in George Street. We haven't covered your tennis playing yet either, and you. I played you with some famous people. Yeah. Um, I was trying to account for them the other night and I couldn't remember the names of them. Um, it was Rod Laver, one of them. Rod Laver. Yeah, the trainer at, at where we used to play for our, our club in O'Brien. Actually, it was actually O'Brien and uh, Wellington Street, the tennis courts were yeah. in behind those two streets. And the bloke who owned the courts one day came to us and said, I've got these two blokes over from New Zealand, let them win. <laughs> and we had to, we could have wished them off the tennis courts we wanted to. <laughs> but um, so we let, let them win. But this is going back to your teenage years, isn't it, playing tennis? We were about, oh, we were about, um, 17 to 18, and um, he ended up winning, um, I know, the thing in England, what is it? Oh, Wimbledon. Wimbledon. Yeah. Jude and I were um, with the children. We had, uh, first of all, we had a place in Edgecliff, which was like, uh, you know how you have a granny flat down the back of something? Yeah. We were behind these other houses at Edgecliff overlooking Hardy Robber. They had a factory down in there. Right. Thing, and the kids used to go to kindergarten for me or go to Double Bay School. Then we, we moved down to New Beach Road, which is in uh, Roshcutter Bay. Jude's mother came back from from England, where Jude was educated in England. Right. She uh, she uh, went to school in like an opportunity class in mm. in England. I was at an opportunity class in Sydney. You had very bright babies too. <laughs> oh yes, very bright. How many children did you have? We had three. Yeah. Which we still got Lisa. Joe and Katie within a year of each other and um, exactly, exactly a year, I'd say, or very close to it anyway. Busy family there for a while. Hmm? Very busy with three small children under a certain age. Oh yeah, 
Jude was a wonderful mother to them, you know, she was so organised mm. and I, I was so busy, like I'd, I'd worked as an employee of a company then I was offered this job with the Pico, first Australian to join them and I was, well apparently very successful with them mm -hmm. and um, Is that an American company? They? Yeah, they become an American company and uh, while I was with them I was offered I was offered the managing director of uh, Rank Xerox which, it's, which is basically an English company but uh, I, did, I knocked it back we were in opposition to them we cleaned them up yeah. <laughs> I remember it was uh, Bob, Bob Hawk in the uh, big hotel at uh, Canberra he was waiting and I was waiting for a car to pick us up. How old were you when this happened? Oh, this is uh, when I was with the peak out. Okay. So uh, I'd be in my thirties. Yeah. And uh, Bob Hawk was the <laughs> promising prime minister at the time. It wasn't the prime minister at that time. Okay. Just about to become one. Yeah. And. Uh, this big Rolls Royce pulled up with a flag on it and everything and he said there's a car probably for you. I said no I think it's for you, it's got the flag on it. <laughs> and yeah, he got in and uh, drove off and waved and about um, two, two weeks later it was at Whitlam, Whitlam was Prime Minister at the time. Um, so you we're might standing have been outside in the St Mary's Cathedral and this car pulled up there and the window came down and he said, uh, how's the transport from Canberra going? It was, it was Bob Hawk calling out to me, you know, he standing on the corner, he remembered <laughs> me. But, um, These chance encounters. When he was living behind us in uh, 32 Beach Road, he was living in the units. Golf. Golf. And um, I remember one day I just turned around and he and Margaret were standing on the ground and they waved to us. <laughs> That's amazing. She used to be a champion swimmer. You were living in Darling Point? Living in uh, New Beach Road. Oh yeah. Which is opposite the um, the yacht club and everything. Oh yeah. How far did you have to go to work each day? Oh, I just used to go and drive to work in William Street. Okay. How long did you live there before you moved? We were there, we went to uh, Waverley. We had a flat at Waverley. Yeah. And another one at um, oh, North Sydney would do, it's close enough to it. And I had an office over there as well. Yeah. And then uh, I had another one further up in Willoughby. But mainly, <laughs> mainly I spent most of my life, most of my working life in the city because right. I had an office in the MLC, MLC building. Okay. And uh, you spend a lot of your working life in and around Martin Place, haven't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, we we built a factory at uh, DY. Yeah. And uh, we we're servicing all our machines from there. Right. And uh, I had an office there too, but mainly it was. Um, mainly servicing our machines, you know, making sure they were going well and yeah. any new products that came out. We uh, spent a lot of time 
flashing them around. <laughs> Sales was a different thing back then, wasn't it? Yeah, a lot allows that we'd have to order what I thought was right, or what if a salesman said to me, we are in trouble in the uh, middle market, you know. The bigger ones are all right, but the smaller ones are okay. We need the middle market. And we'd have a, a late night conference on that. And mm. You were in a position to actually influence and I'd order designed them. and manufactured. Yeah, I'd order them from the States, you know. Right. And uh, the end, in the long run, we got Japanese machines as well. Mm -hmm, okay. In other words, you ran your, your own business here in uh, whatever the Yanks did. We, we did better than they did most of the time. Mm. But, um, the Yanks are very, actually, believe it or not, the Yanks aren't as smart as they make out. A bit slow. They are, really. I mean it. They, they, they think they're wonderful, but they're quite, they need the input from somewhere else all the time. Right. Even if it was from Egypt or somewhere. Okay. Didn't make it, we'd have conferences everywhere. I had other photos. I, um, I remember we went in the oldest restaurant in Rome mm. and uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it now. How old is, a, is the oldest restaurant in Rome? Oh, you know. How far back are we talking? We're talking about the steps to it were curved out by your feet. Oh, wow. You know. So going back generations. Uh, oh, generations. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, I remember a knock on the door, and it was um, Joseph Cotton, a film star at the time, with his lady. They'd been doing a film there, mm. and he knocked to to uh, go to the restaurant. And I, they were going to shut him out. I said, "Let him in." And he and I were standing on the table doing <laughs> doing some mad dance, you know. <laughs> Uh, so you recognised him, but... I recognised him straight away, yeah. <laughs> but, um, Joseph Cotton. Uh, Joseph Cotton? Well, he's in lots of pictures. Uh, lots. He was doing a film at the time with Joseph Cotton, Orson Welles. Oh, I see. Okay. Orson Welles. All uh, old timers now. So the red wine went down that night, did it? <laughs> oh yeah, plenty of it. <laughs> and uh, mm, sounds like fun. But your work gave you a lot of opportunity, but it also took you on spontaneous oh, yeah. kinds of adventures, didn't it? Oh yeah. Well, living a long run, my wife and I separated, mm. and uh, but we've always been good friends. Yeah. How long were you um, together? Oh God! Well, all through the kids, they didn't know we were separated, you know, because I was oh, always okay. there. Yeah, yeah. I'd be there most nights for dinner or something, and yeah. most weekends I'd take them somewhere. Working in this business environment is, um, you know, often under pressure to, you know, sell, 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 and profit and all that stuff. But then there was this other side of you that was. An activist and a you know, oh, yeah, well, strong yeah. belief in human rights and and you took part in protests. Oh yes, well, so you, Vietnam. Uh, I was uh, against all that business, mm -hmm. and uh, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, lay on the floor in Oxford Street oh. <laughs> to stop. Um, <laughs> The Premier Arthur Askin with the Yank, what was his name, um, Johnson, coming around the big open car. Oh my goodness. And Askin, as the Premier New South, well, I saw them lying on the road and he said, run over the bastards. How many were there? That was the Premier. Hmm? How many people were taking part in that protest? Oh, hell of a down. lot. You know, the whole street was covered with protests, you know. Yeah. But, uh, run over the bastards. 
For yeah. anyone that's been born since then, can you describe um, as concisely as you can? I know it's complicated, but why were people protesting the Vietnam War? Well, they didn't want us to be involved in another war. And uh, it was a war of... Uh, it wasn't declared, you know, like it was, Vietnam was uh, being suppressed by the Chinese and the Americans on either side. Like every war that's on now, it's, it's through the United States. Like uh, everything that's happened in, um, in the Far East and everything like that, you'll find that the Yanks are there. Yeah. And the soldiers don't know what they're fighting for, got no idea. Yeah. Yeah. They just think that's what you do. Orders. Mm. Mm. Was the anti-Vietnam movement um, a certain, was it the younger generation or was it, it was across, both. across all ages? That both, you know, you get a group out of the older yeah. ones, but the young ones are in it. A lot from university. Late, you know, the majors, the the, the, the uh, you know, schools are getting ready to go to uni and all that. I, uh, <laughs> they were all um, had their ideas on it. Yeah. Majority of them were against the war, and it, see, it wasn't really a war. It was. A, the French, they were, all Vietnam and that was run by France. While well, Vietnam got yeah. involved and uh, yeah. they protected their own country and the Yanks they had to get out of there. In the end they had to get, they flew in planes and took all the people out of there because they were, uh, people were involved that shouldn't have had anything to do with it. But uh, there's a lot of underground, like uh, channels under the uh, Hanoi and all that. Physically uh, under the ground? Uh, uh, under the ground. Mm -hmm. and they were living in under, mm -hmm. and coming up with a night and fighting the Yanks. Oh, really? Mm. Mm. It was dreadful. Yeah. Little kids and had, had no idea what was going on. There was a point where you're taking part in a protest and then your work life collided a little bit on one awkward occasion. Did you want to tell me about that? Oh yeah, I was coming up George Street with a, <laughs> coming up George Street outside the town hall to turn into Park Street. Yeah. And I was at, in an apartment by, owned by um, Jim Verge, who owned a Red Leaf Pool and donated it to the Wallara Council. A beautiful home next door to the Fairfaxes. And uh, so I saw the, I saw them coming up thing and I just stood in front of their TV with a, with my coat and everything, so they didn't see it was me. Because you were there with your work cohort in the room. Yeah, uh, all right wingers. Mm. And uh, <laughs> I was there with, with, me, with my coat spread out across the front of the TV set so they wouldn't see me. <laughs> they said, oh, get out of the way. I said, what for? What do you want to see that for? <laughs> anyway, there were a couple of occasions on those sort of things. I can't think of the other ones, but that one stood out. Oh, I used to get into arguments with uh, if you brought the subject up, 
sometimes, you know, you couldn't let it go without saying something. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I had young blokes that worked for me, even when I had the shops in Windsor and that, um, that never had a quid to bless themselves with. Any money they uh, they they'd spend like rockets, yeah. and they, the next thing they were around bo borrowing money from me. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. Tell her you were a visitor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just get it out of the machine. What did you Let us know when you want another. What does the machine say? Well, <laughs> it, didn't, okay. it didn't obey me because well, I'm not good at reading instructions. I think that's the thing you do as a last resort. It's going to get to a stage where you won't have to ask for anything. It'll all be machines. Yeah. Not too long either. Yeah. Nobody mm. will have any money. <laughs> mm. But we'll have our credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. God. Is All that right. something you thought about when you were selling the first um, sophisticated office equipment? Mm -hmm. Did you think about that all the way back then? That this is the start of technology starting to... Well, I knew it, 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 it would expand. Yeah. All the time, you know, and every, every week there was something happening. Somebody had come and try to flog us from manual sort of operations. Yeah. Now, for instance, the adding machine was all manual. An adding machine? Just an adding machine, like, a, you, in other words, you've got to do a... a an invoice for somebody. Yeah. So you do it on the, on the adding machine, which reduces a, a roll of paper. Oh, yes. And then you pull the handle for every action. Okay. Like you might have a dollar sixty or a dollar eighty. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Each one here. Yeah. I'm Takes thirty-seven. Hours. I've only ever seen those on TV. <coughs> there are kids watching this video that will never have heard of anything like it. So yeah. this is really interesting. To yeah, a dollar eight here or something. Okay, there, now that's three dollars forty already because you put two entries in. Yeah. Dollar sixty and a dollar eighty or something. And pull the handle each time. Yeah. Yeah, now, now it's so quick. Yeah. You don't even do it with a The first of the computers were enormous things, like the first one in um, Commonwealth Bank in, in Sydney. Did you see took, it? Yeah, it took the whole floor up in the basement of the Commonwealth Bank. It was amazing. It was the whole floor of the, all the computers that are there, huge, I mean to say, that uh, television set there would be minute compared to the screen on this thing and these great big rolls of paper going around it. Oh. Yeah. I nearly died when I walked in there just to see it, you know. Yeah. But, um, and then all the banks used to use that one one computer at one, one time. Oh, right. And then gradually it all started in Martin Place. Uh, so they'd give the uh, Commonwealth up the road to be the, or across the road to be Queensland Insurance or something, all the way up Martin Place, up Pitt Street, all feeding off this one machine and gradually it was just hopeless. It was too slow. Right. And they'd 
And gradually they got to units for each person or each each bank. That kind of tells us how expensive the technology was too, doesn't it? Because if each bank couldn't really afford their own No, well they couldn't. That means it must have been it so cost expensive. a fortune for this big thing that went in there. Yeah. And each one were paying to use it. Where the big one was in the Commonwealth Bank, upstairs were offices of the federal government. Oh. Feeding off it as well. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Remember in the lift one day when I don't know who it was, was Ben Chifley or one of the Prime Ministers tapped me on the shoulder and right? he'd been there a week. <laughs> and he said, how are you going with your your job, you know? I was only a, what do you call it, um, giving out letters and that. Oh, you're in the mail room, that's in right. In the mail room. Yeah. He asked me how I'm, uh, tapped me on the shoulder, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> it was Ben Chifley, Dad. Oh, it was Ben Chifley. Ben Chifley. And he knew your stuff. name, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, he said, Ken, how are you going? Yeah. You know, I found out later it was Ben Chifley. But then I went into the selling of, uh, of uh, computers and that. And, uh, but they're all manual sort of things. Yeah. The start and each. Every now and then they'd bring in something new for us to learn. God. And people would say, oh, this is going to be too much. Nobody will buy these. <laughs> and I wasn't of that thought. I said, you've got to get out and sell them. Would you say you were probably more forward thinking than most people around you? I think so. Yeah. I think so. It, um, what about it. that fax machine though, Dad? Which was that? Remember that person wanted you to buy the fax machine? Or they wanted to sell the fax machine? Oh, that was um, IBM. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to sell, sell uh, they wanted me to take over their IBM and sell um, their fax machines and that. And I thought, I thought they were a little bit before time. Right. It, um, the market wasn't ready or... Is that what you mean? It took a while for them to get on the... Maybe I should have gone into that earlier. But, um... Yes, there's time for everything, you know. Like if, if you rush in, you might muck up the whole damn thing. Most of the companies were very sl slack, but um, the company I was with, um, a Pico, was in in its field. It was probably ahead of most most of them because they were um, we were always bringing out new machines to try. Yeah. And um, like rank Xerox. Uh, it was our opposition. We cleaned them out of Sydney. They were all on a rental basis. We were selling our machines, smaller. Yeah. Um, in other words, you could put two or three machines in to an office, yeah. which means there's no waiting to use them. Oh. Uh, and uh, uh, they had their problems. Yeah. But the fact is that uh, you've got three machines there. Two of them are going to be working all the time, or one of them is going to be working. Uh, whereas Rank Xerox had a, each machine was huge. Right. You would take up the, you know, that window and out to here, sort <laughs> of thing. Wow. They did the job very well, but you'd have a queue of people waiting to use them. Not practical. And uh, yeah. they couldn't afford, they were on a rental basis, they could, couldn't afford to buy them. Yeah. So we just 
slipped under them, sold the machine to small ones. It didn't work all the time. <laughs> Worked sometimes. But um, it was interesting to see what the reception was. People were, were amazed that they could just go and get a copy out of something that normally you'd stand in a queue for. Yeah. And then, uh, then the only reason that company failed, they had we had operations in 23 countries and uh, they failed because of uh, greed and money of the operational were taking all the dough out of the company and spending it on luxury things mm. all by me. <laughs> You were sales director of Apico between 1961 and 1973. Mm. Have I got mm. that right? Sounds right. Yeah. Do you feel like you were an influence on making sure people were treated well? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was very. I looked after my workers very well. And if I if it was a decision to to make, I'd have to I'd listen to both sides of something. Mostly we got on fairly, fairly well with the staff and the management. Yeah. But you had to force the issue uh, if, um, if suddenly you found that one side is right and the other side is wrong. So you had to dive in and um, do your best to find out the truth. Mm -hmm. But. Um, but we had a very friendly deal with the uh, service people and ourselves, you know. Mm. But um, and we used to treat them well, like um, like if I had to go overseas or something, they'd go with me, mm. like the service. So uh, the people that we were going to, who we would probably place machines with. Yeah. We're getting this. They knew they were getting the whole deal. They weren't mistreated, yeah. which is very important. That um, and that's what's wrong with a lot of the companies still today. All they're thinking about is the the money, yeah. and not really thinking about uh, who who is producing it for them. Yeah. But, but uh, if, if they all made efforts to do, to do things like that, it would have helped me in every business the same as in in um, in uh, retail retail even like David Jones and that uh, fiddling around a few months ago when I walked into David Jones to buy a couple of pair of pants. And I ended up talking to a bloody statue. And I did it deliberately. And the bloke came up and said, Can I help you? I said, Oh, yes, you can. You can answer the questions I've asked this person. You... <laughs> I said, well, What do you mean? It's a statue, another model. I Maybe. said, Yeah, I know that, but the fact is that uh, there was no one on the floor. <laughs> So I could have just taken the pants and gone to him. I said, you know, look, it's not business. Yeah. It should be here, either service people or somebody here to cope. But they're saving money. Yeah. But they're not, they're losing money. Yeah, yeah. They think they're saving money. Do you think they got your point? Oh, I think so. Uh, next time I went there, I bought two pair of pants. <laughs> From a mannequin or from a service? <laughs> Probably a mannequin, I think. <laughs> she became a friend of yours for a good long time after oh, yeah. that chance meeting. I used to go there for, you know, just knock on the door and if she had a boyfriend there or 
Yeah. So yeah, I'd go down in the lift. Yeah. And I'd ring her from the nearest phone box <laughs> and say I was there. Yeah. Yes, I know. <laughs> you went down in the lift. How did you meet? Uh, that's where I met her at the bus stop in um, uh, near Wentworth Park. Yeah. I was going to the dogs. Yeah. Or the trots. The trots. The trots. And um, I thought I'd just go down and catch the bus. Yeah. So uh, he came down, walked down with me, and then he went off. We could see a bus coming on, the bus went straight past. Oh, and then she pulled up, her and her friend pulled up in this big humber car and said, I wonder, wonder, young man, can you tell me how to get to Whitworth Park Trots? I said, I'm going there myself, I'll just miss the bus. <laughs> she said, that's probably my fault, because <laughs> I drove past it, that's right. Oh. And she said, I'll be in. Hopped in there and her little, terrible little puppy tried to bite me, I think. <laughs> but anyway... What was your first impression of her? Oh, it's just a sophisticated old girl. Mm. I knew she had plenty of, plenty of dough. She wanted to have... I was talking about two, two trotters I was going out the back. Yeah. And she said, oh, oh I'll have 50 on her both. Oh, yeah. You know, I said, God, I'm only going you know, to have $10 on them both. <laughs> and um, anyway, they both won. I said, well, you better check on your car because it got <laughs> hit, hit by the back, in the back by a tram going to Wentworth Park. The, the, they dug up the road for the new tram line and um, the tram came through and... She went into the wrong place. Mm -hmm. When you drive, you don't drive. Drive mm -hmm. where they're fixing tram lines for right. trams. And the tram hit the back and broke one of the tail lights. And uh, so she just gave me the keys. Said, would you mind? I said, I had suggested I'd go have a look at it. And she said, oh, here's the keys. Just get in whatever's wrong with it. <laughs> just park it somewhere else and I did you know like I'm a complete stranger yeah she trusted and, you straight away anyway we drove home that night with her and a fr friend who's who was actually a French extra actress okay uh, pretty well known at the time hmm. and um, she uh, we had a couple of drinks yeah. at her place and uh, and then on the Saturday she said, oh, on, that was a Friday night, and she said, why don't you come round tomorrow and we'll have a couple of bets on the horses. Oh, yeah. And I did, and I used to do it every Saturday. Maybe she was a little lonely <laughs> and needed a friend. Oh, well, she had me. <laughs> yeah, possibly, but mainly I think uh, her and the old girl with the mink coat on. <laughs> The French actress. Um, <clears throat> I used to go out for lunch every day, somewhere in the city. Yeah. What were you doing in your last paid job? Well, that was um, that was Clark Rubber, really. Okay. I decided to leave it and finish up work and then I got offered a job <laughs> in, in uh, running a pub for for another friend of mine. Yeah. They own a few pubs and they want me to, I, I ran, I ran the um, Fitzroy for them when they went overseas and I also ran the Macquarie Arms for them when the Johnny Ross went overseas. Mm -hmm. I ran that for them. For someone to leave their business um, in your hands you must be Well they know, they know that them. I well, I know what I'm doing when I yeah. I don't have to be taught to get into it to yeah. you know 
It sounds like you enjoyed the pubs too. Yeah, well I have a lot of friends there, you know. Yeah. Is that what impacted on you to um, to be passionate about rights at work and that whole labour direction, or was it just a combination of a few different things? Oh yeah, my grandfather was mainly uh, steel stuff and that. Yeah. And the end of uh, metal metal business. Yeah. He had his. Grandkids working for him, some of them, and uh, he used to go and stick his nose in and and do the work anyway himself, mm. and it just killed him. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered. I went home after you told me that story, and you know, so much of that um, unionism is based on you know ensuring people are safe in the workplace and blah, blah, blah. So I wondered if there was a connection with that or if it was just generally all labour values that had made you such a loyal labour voter. Well, a lot of people, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people owe a lot to unions, you know, and um, more than they think they do mm. because they, uh, um, a lot of them would be dead by now mm -hmm. if it wasn't for the unions. But, um, you know, safety regulations and things like that. Because dreadful things were happening. Mm -hmm. Well, that'll be sure we right. Don't worry, just put another wall over there. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, it's only one, one brick wide. Or something, you know, something where you should have two. Yeah. What they've what they've successfully done is to separate the people from each other, you know, yeah. making um, pe people uh, frightened of unions that unions are going to reef their money out of them and all that. But uh, well, they've allowed it to happen on the other side. Like, um, there's people working now for five dollars an hour where they should be getting 15 or 20. People don't understand it. They just read what the te Daily Telegraph tells them. And the Daily Telegraph tells so many lies, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. Matter of fact, if you go through the Telegraph, you can go for 14 pages and find no news <laughs> that is worthwhile yeah. and uh, maybe a one page of news might cover the lot mm -hmm. and they go crook at the Herald and the Herald at least has some pages of news in it yeah. but, um, and they keep most of their ads to the back of the paper yeah. but, um, How has media changed? for you mm. in your lifetime. What changes have you seen in the way news is presented? Well, I'd rather have um, a channel to or, or look for something off offbeat, you know, like 7-2 or something. Yeah. I'd be looking for uh, something that interests me only or interested uh, in the development of things. You've only got to go to the news agency. There's a stack of telegraphs for sale and about three or four heralds, mm. you know, mm. which is sad, really. But um, I see our mother, Fairfax, now is selling her place next door to Redleaf Pool. He's selling her place at the moment. Yeah. She'll probably go and live in an apartment in Potts Point or something and die there. Yeah. Poor old bugger. I mean, rich old bugger. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, 
<laughs> you know, she'll be forgotten. Whereas, um, uh, you know, like the bloke who has the Telegraph owns newspapers in England and America. Mm-hmm. He, he couldn't care less about Australia mm-hmm. at all. He's only, only interested in his making more money. It's the same as, um, what's his name, with his Crown Casino. I know they nearly killed me, nearly ran over me outside the old Astra Hotel. <laughs> I was just crossing the road after having breakfast there. And I'm crossing and that bullfitted uh, son was driving out of his house. Now there, there's a... The Packers? Yeah. Frank Packers was the <laughs> old man. So you got tapped on the shoulder by Ben Chifley. You um, grabbed a car each with Bob Hawke and then saw him outside St Mary's Cathedral. And nearly got run over by a packer. <laughs> well, packer, what he did to me, I'm crossing the road and he's looking to the left. Uh, and I'm coming from the right. Yeah. I'm in the yellow crossing. And he just drove straight at me. Then uh, he realised and he stopped. Uh, and I banged on his bonnet. <laughs> banged on his bonnet and I said, please look where you're going. <laughs> and of me lying there and you in jail if you hit me. <laughs> anyway, he was apologetic. But, um. <laughs> you know that Australian boy who's doing very well in America now? He played in. Um, uh, looked a bit of a buff to me. <laughs> But um, <laughs> he's done very well. He's a multi-millionaire now. An actor or a musician? He's got two. He's got another brother who. Oh, the Hemsworths. Liam, yeah, Hemsworth. Yeah. Uh, I met him in the <laughs> in the foyer of there, <laughs> and uh, just by accident, somebody introduced him to me, and I thought he doesn't look so smart. He's smart enough, <laughs> but uh, he looked like a, a bit of a, a buff head, you know. <laughs> but he's done very well for himself. Yeah, yeah. And his brother's doing well for himself. Yeah. How did you come to choose to live in the Hawkesbury and move here? Well, what we did, we were bought out from um, from uh, Darling Point by the owners of the building. They bought us out. Right. Gave us money to get out, in other words. They wanted to do them up and right. put garages underneath and all that. Went back up and got our place back at Edgecliff. We uh, decided to build a weekender up somewhere. So we went driving around and we drove up to Windsor. Yeah. And we saw this for sale sign at Freeman's Reach. And um What was your first impression of the area? Well I thought uh, first of all I thought, oh god, I can't stand this. <laughs> There's nothing to do here. <laughs> anyway, we end up buying a block. Yeah. I think it cost us $90 or something. <laughs> something terribly cheap. And, uh, <laughs> but from there we've expanded to three and a quarter acres. Right. And uh, roughly what year? Do you remember what year we're talking about here? Well, I'd remember what a... How old you were, maybe? Um, Just give us a rough ballpark. Good. The kids were how big? Oh, they were. They were at school. Mm, okay. They were at. Uh, they went to Freeman Street School. Yeah. How big was it? How From many Double kids? Bay. They were at Double Bay School. 
<laughs> went to and Fremo. We took her up to uh, took her up to thing and introduced them to the locals, the headmaster. Yeah. Well, Lisa would have been about she's sixty now. Yeah. So she would have been about twelve or something. How many kids were at the school? About was it a big school or was it a little? No, no, only a few. Yeah. Were they all together in one class? No, I think they had a few classes. Oh, okay. Now the school's gone, they built a there's a high school up there now. Yeah. Freeman's Ridge. Yeah, the kids had um, they did very well actually. Yeah. Was there, was, I'm not surprised. Well, they're not <laughs> terrible, terribly good teachers, but still, <laughs> they did quite well. But uh, only through their own achievements, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, and you, but you were still working in the city too, and you had to go back and forth. Oh yeah, I used to drive down f f from up here. We end up building, uh, starting instead of just building a weekend or we built a double story place. Oh, okay. Which Jude's still in it. Yep. And um, we were only discussing the other day putting a, um, a hot water, not a hot water, um, a heating thing in there. Oh, yeah. For the two stories. Yeah. Joe, jo, my son, makes the most of the decisions on that because he seems to know more about it than I do. And um, just to give uh, comfort to Jude, you know, yeah. in her old age, you know. But she's terrific. She's terrific with the kids. Yeah. And terrific with the grandkids. They all love her, you know. But um, she knows how to handle children. Yeah. But uh, anyway, they. Uh, and they've got to handle me. <laughs> <laughs>
But, uh, our, so the plan was to take the family on. Oh, we used to go everywhere. We used to go up to Hawkesbury and down these hills and down the coast. and With brakes that didn't entirely work. <laughs> work stairs were hopeless. <laughs> Went down to hospice and places and all the drives were pretty hair-raising. <laughs> but everyone has lived to tell the tale, obviously, so you must have been able to well, wrangle it pretty well. It's still there, but just lying on flat tyres and everything, just outside the the house itself really, yeah. between the house and uh, Joe's uh, workshop, he's got his music thing there and then if you go along a bit further there's the, what we call the shed which we made for Katie and her husband, yeah. they live in that okay. and they share the, the main things with the house, you know, toiletry and yeah. Hot water and all that business. Yeah. And the kitchen. So everybody, I'm guessing everybody has a pretty deep connection to this property because it goes so far oh, back. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we'd actually, when we were done, we didn't put it on there. First we put it on friends of ours further along. And uh, until we were able to uh, put a fence around the property. and. Yeah. And then we moved in there, we stayed in that for a while. Yeah. And then built the house around <laughs> next door to it. But, uh, and then I used to go drive from here to my office down in DY. Yeah. What was that drive like before the M2 and the M7? Dreadful. <laughs> it was dreadful even back then. Dreadful. <laughs> And uh, we used to do uh, shopping, everything originally in Windsor or uh, into Riverston. Yeah, let's let's teach the kids what what it was like to do the family shopping each week. Well, you did a lot of it in Rivale, Riverston, and uh, what was it, Rivo? Fruit and veggies, was it? Oh, just like a big grocery shop or something. You know? Okay. And then they opened up South Windsor after they built a lot of uh, houses down there, mainly for the Air Force. I see. The Air Force built houses there. But there's a deli there now, and a, you know, there's all those essential shops, the newsagent, bakery, deli, takeaways. And what was there then? They gradually built, built shops along, you know, like for local shops and they, yeah. some of them built and closed up very quickly. Uh, it's pretty prosperous that little strip of shops there now. Well South Windsor is more prosperous than Windsor itself. Hmm. Windsor's dead as a doornail now. You were at Clark Rubber in Windsor. Clark Rubber and I also did part time. Oh, okay. Uh, part time for uh, a mate of mine who owned a pub. Yeah. I used to go out and help him on the weekend and that. And um, you've pulled a few thousand beers, haven't you? Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had a thing outside the outside the pub selling sausages on rolls <laughs> with a queue a mile bloody long. <sighs> On a Sunday. You can sell anything, can't you? Sell anything, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you were an employee, but you still have quite an um, entrepreneurial spirit, don't you? Oh, yeah, well, uh, and they all, even today, these say, uh, I can't recognise some of the blokes. Mm. They all recognise me. <laughs> but, um, Which pubs in the Hawkesbury have you worked in? Originally it was the Macquarie Arms, yeah. and then uh, later the F Fitzroy, yeah. and also the little one, the, the um, one on the corner of Johnson Street. The um, um, down George Street. I think it's called the. I've forgotten myself. It's just one street down. Oh, just a little just bit, a little bit, bit yeah. Um, 
on the way down to Woolworth to Coles. Yeah, I've forgotten too. It's, I'm sorry, whoever's listening. I think they call it the Rex. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's changed. Well, a mate of mine had them and wanted clay. Wanted to uh, do something and the other one had come yeah. and say, would you help us for a while? <laughs> All right, okay. Hey, do you remember when George Street was open to traffic all the way through? Yeah. Would you say it would prosper once again if they opened it up again? Because there was talk of that. Well, was, there, <laughs> there was chances of, if they did, it'd be better to open it up as a one way. Yeah without any doubt because the parking here is so useless mm. and so dangerous, you know. Yeah. You're driving up there and somebody's liable to open the door. Yeah. Either the driver or the somebody in the back would open up to get a packet of wheat mix out or something. <laughs> and bang. And that's actually one Sunday, I mean there was a member of the parliament in uh, Canberra, they were just going out for a drive. Yeah. He came the road and ran into somebody's door. And he was most apologetic. On oh, George Street. And gave the card, send me the bill, you know. <laughs> it, uh, I wonder if anyone else would re remembers that. That's looks so, so funny. funny, but, uh, they, but you know, they, they, people don't think either. Yeah. You know, they just open the door and she be right. <laughs> she be right while you, somebody's cut their arm off or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just wondered to someone that's um, good at spotting opportunity and you know good with markets and business and stuff. What you, you know, a lot of locals are always talking about how Winds has died and you know there's just so many empty shops. So I just wonder what your professional opinion would be, like what would fix that? Well I, I reckon there was one way traffic would be alright. Yeah. Perhaps on the way down. Yeah. Which would open up further, would help everybody on, even in South Windsor. Yeah, yeah. They don't think, uh, like we had a mayor here who was absolutely hopeless. <laughs> absolutely hopeless. How far back are we talking? I'm talking about the one before that's here now. Oh, yeah. There's a girl here, a woman here now, Mrs. Bucket. But there was another one before that. Kim Ford. Hmm? Kim Ford. Yeah. It's hopeless. <laughs> and they found a, a drawer full of requests, which mm -hmm. he did nothing about. Mm -hmm. uh, complaints and all that. Including a couple from me. Yeah. So stupid, you know, like the people were falling over in the street, tripping on the on the uh, bricks. Yeah. That, and as soon as she got in, she did uh, a lot of uh, cementing of the yeah. things, which is good. She's a good act. But uh, she's doing a quite a reasonable job, you know. Yeah. With the lack of money and everything. Yeah. Well, I remember one time there in when the floods were on, before the actual bridge was built down from the Jolly Frog. Yeah. And I remember <laughs> they'd just uh, put a new bottled apartment in. But they forgot to bolt it to the ground. <laughs> and the bottle department sailed down to the ha, <laughs> down to the river. Just went floating by. <laughs> there there've been a few floods in your time here. Oh yeah. There? Well I remember at times I'd go to be going down to Sydney, I'd get behind a truck and hope that he went through fairly quickly so it spread the water <laughs> and I didn't get it on my bonnet. Oh my goodness. And I'd just get out at McGrath's Hill and I'd just start to cough a bit then. Oh. But, 
that I'd, <laughs> I'd get to work. But, um, oh no. <laughs> by the time I'd get to work, she was hot enough. But, um, yeah. Oh yeah, there were times when you couldn't couldn't leave Freeman's Reach. Yeah. Yeah. What was the mood in the community when there was a big flood on? Um, how would you describe everybody's mood or attitude or? Oh, they all do what they did. They just timed themselves and they did things for other people. You know, uh, they they'd go and do the shopping and. Yeah. They're all helpful. Yeah. Matter of fact, there's a woman in here now, one of the reckless, reckless of the family. <laughs> it was her name. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying that, that she's a reckless person. <laughs> no, and her name is okay. G Gertie Records, reckless. Okay. But uh, she, she remembers uh, Lisa. And, oh when Lisa was in the, tended to her when she was in hospital. Yeah. But, um, and uh, we remember her kids and everything. Her, fa her husband's name was Kenneth. Yeah. Same as mine. But uh, they, they lived up uh, on the top part of uh, Windsor, Freeman's Ridge called Reckless Corner. Oh, okay. <laughs> So not after the driving, no, but but after the, the family. <laughs> and the family. What's it say, David Jones? It says Labour Party, Sid Einfeld, Enfeld, Sid Enfeld at Bondi Junction. Say it again. She's written Labour Party, comma, Sid Einfeld. Enfeld? Sid Einfeld, yeah. Einfeld? He was the... Uh, Bondi Junction. Yeah, state member for... for uh, state government, Labor. Yeah. Sid Einfeld. So today, uh, uh, today's equivalent, what, with uh, Luke Foley? Yeah. Yep. But, um... Did you meet Sid? Oh yeah. Yeah. I met them all. <laughs> but my grandmother was. Uh, uh, she don't even have to mention that she couldn't get up the stairs outside the place at Bellevue Hill, and the next thing they'd be in there putting stairs up for her. Oh, well, that's nice. And so she, you're a member of your local branch then, and consider yourself a unionist. Oh yeah. I was, Yep. It was very important, really, to uh, get in either side of politics when I when I was growing up, because uh, it was still very really important. You know, see, for instance, at the moment they've got this business about um, you know um, getting married with men and women. Mm -hmm. What do they call it? Same-sex. Same-sex business. Yeah. Well, to me, I don't care if they do or not, but mm -hmm. I voted yes. <laughs> but the only thing is, what's going to be happening as soon as they, they bring a movie out or something about something, people say, oh, I saw them going into the what's that dirty movie or something, you know. It'll, uh, you don't know whether it will create the good things or the bad things. It depends on the way the, uh, the promotions are, of things go on, you know. Oh, uh, you mean the discussion that goes on yeah. at the same time as the issue being mm. in the news? And, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. They'll, uh, to me, I don't care. Yeah. I'm quite happy, whatever they do. But um, it's none of my business anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a lot of money to, being spent on things like that at the moment, which to me, I think, I just spent 122 million 
that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, little dips out of that for education, medicine, schools. Yeah. They should be coped with um, yeah. quicker, you know. Yeah. Put money into those sort of things. And uh, it's terribly important. There's so many things to do in government and all these things are being left behind. Yeah. They're not being done. And um, the funny part about it is that um, Malcolm Turnbull originally applied to uh, the Labor Party to join them and uh, he was a best friend of Paul Keating. Yeah, yeah. And Paul Keating he said, no you can't join, he said you're too rich. <laughs> and he's a multi-millionaire, you know. Yeah. And um, he was talking about people donating to the um, to different things, and his only donation was to the um, to the Liberal Party. Yeah, yeah. I thought it might be nice to pick a school or something. Turnbull turned back to Keating and said, uh, well, you're not short of a quid. He said, no, I know. But he said, at least I'll spend it on uh, right things for the public, hmm. which he did. By coincidence, uh, <laughs> Katie and I were coming into the main road to North Richmond yesterday and uh, toot toot on the horn it was Blake going past. <laughs> Haven't seen him for a week, a couple of weeks. Yeah. But, um, so how does Blake's music go back with you? Well what happened is uh, originally Blake was, he came and lived with us as a boy for a while oh. and then he um, He's like a cousin to to Jude, rather than me. Right. His father owned the music sh uh, music shop in Darlinghurst, which is a, probably one of the best in Sydney. Then he bought the shop next door, which was an antique shop. And the trouble is, you could never contact him, Tony, because he was in business looking at all the antiques that he owned when he bought the shop oh, right. <laughs> and taking home pianos and things like that <laughs> but um, he lives over at uh, uh, what's the little bridge it goes to mainly uh, the Spit when you come down from the Spit Bridge? No, you come down, come down from uh, Mossman there's a that'd bridge. Be, that'd be the spit, wouldn't it? The, oh yeah, there's a spit. That's yeah. a spit bridge. Yeah. He lives opposite that. Oh okay. Oh, that's a nice spot. He's got a nice place here, but it's loaded with loaded with furniture and and <laughs> guitars. I bought my very first guitar at Blake's Music, and then went on to become a professional musician. So I'm fascinated with this story. Yeah, well, you would have bought off Blake. Probably. Probably. It was probably him that demoed it to. It was an old, crappy $60 nylon string. But I loved that thing. I just loved it. <laughs> well, he was, uh, he knew his music. Yeah. And um, he's a very good guitarist. Yeah. He went overseas. He was in Spain for quite a while. Yeah. And uh, in there, out here, he was teaching Spaniards how to play guitars. That's pretty impressive, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, he's, he still owns, or Blake, Blake ended up buying that building. And uh, was it Blake you dealt with at all? It, I just and remember Blake a very friendly there. man, and he just played the first few bars of Tears in Heaven to me on this guitar I was about to buy. I was only about 13, but I'd saved up my pennies shoveling horse poo. I'd say that would be his father. <laughs> it was probably, oh, okay. Oh, it could be Blake. Blake's um, youngish man. All I Blake's remember, he's very smiley, 
and he played it for Oh, that'd be him. Kate, <laughs> Kate, uh, no, um, Blake is about two years younger than Lisa. Ah, okay. And she's 60. Oh, it was probably him. Yeah, I'm mm. 37. And, and he, I was about he got, uh, got a lot of bands uh, together to help them. And um, they, they earned a lot of money through Blake. Yeah. But, um, we all know Blake's music just as a, you know, we all have known of Blake's music our whole lives, but pro yeah. probably not about Blake himself. No. So, this it's is just Blake's music, that's it. Yeah. And um, Blake, uh, Blake uh, ended up getting married and um, they still live over at Seaforth. Right. That's where they are, Seaforth. Oh, beautiful place. And, um, I've only been to the place about four times. Mm -hmm. Blake ended up buying it. So if he was based on the northern beaches, did he establish the business here because of his link with you, you guys? With who? Well, I'm just wondering why, if he was established in Darlinghurst and lived at Seaforth. Oh, that was the father. Oh, right. The okay. father. And Blake was at Seaforth, but Blake, Blake's father uh, had the Darlinghurst one. Right. And uh, I think he had to borrow money from from his father, or his father invested for him yeah. up at uh, Windsor, and he did very well there, mm. and uh, very well indeed. And. Um, and of course, Jude, my, my wife, is an accomplice uh, with a piano. Mm -hmm. We've got a baby grand, you know. Okay. And she can play it. She, she, at uh, the rooms aren't right there. Rooms, uh, a baby grand takes up a lot of space, you know. It does. Just as a bit of a tangent, um, do you recall any Maltese residents in the area, any Maltese families in Freeman's Reach at the time? Just because I'm researching that too at the moment. There were some Maltese people, I can't think of their names. Okay. They were on farms? Mm -hmm. They were on farms growing yeah. veggies? There was one at the entrance to uh, the road to Freeman's Reach. Okay. There was another one halfway up right. Gorick's Lane. Yeah. And uh, I think there were about three or four. Yeah, okay. They've done all right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm just um, I'm researching Maltese families in the area, the history of it. So. Mm. They can turn a non productive place into. Uh, quite a good productive yeah. deal. Yeah. They know what to do, you know. Yeah. There's one cow there, poor bloody cow, lives by itself. <laughs> and it has one one baby a year, I think. Yeah. And they take it away. And there's another one on the way. <laughs> and the poor cow thinking, oh, not again. <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriends and I could all relate to that a bit. <laughs> yeah, here we go again. 